uh, today we're continuing in uh, our sermon series, Journey to the First Christmas. And this uh, series is based on a small group curriculum uh, called The Journey by a pastor named Adam Hamilton. And what we're doing is we're retracing the steps of Joseph and Mary that led to the first Christmas. And Advent, it's the Advent season. Advent means arrival. In this whole Advent season, we're preparing ourselves for the arrival of Jesus. It's kind of like we're reenacting that first Christmas. And we do that every Advent season. So we prepare our own hearts. What does it mean to, to welcome Jesus into my life in a new way? And so we're, we're in that, this season of preparation, preparing for the arrival of Jesus all over again. This week, we're talking about the journey, as Robin read, that uh, Joseph and Mary took from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And this is a journey that they didn't want to take. Sometimes we take journeys in life that we don't want to take, correct? This is a journey that they didn't look forward to. They didn't plan. Uh, they didn't have a choice. Uh, Luke tells us that Joseph and Mary made this trip because they were forced to by a Roman census that was taken. It required uh, uh, the male of the head of household to return to the place of his birth. And so when Joseph and Mary uh, were married, they probably settled in Nazareth, her hometown, but they had to travel to Joseph's hometown of Bethlehem for this census. Now, not only did they not want to go on the journey, but the journey actually got harder as it went on. And sometimes that's the case, isn't it? When we take journeys in life that we don't want to take in the first place, sometimes we in, you know, are in that journey and then we realize, oh my goodness, the plot thickens. It just got harder. This, this new th I thought it was hard enough, but now this new thing happened that is even more challenging. And you know, we have sayings like, when it rains, it pours. It's to describe like when things just seem to pile on and, and there's, there's another turn of events that we didn't see coming and that was the true, or that was true for the journey that Mary and Joseph took that led to the first Christmas. And when, when that happens to us in our lives, we start to ask questions like, why? God, why? Why, why did you allow this to happen? Why, why am I going through this? Or we start to ask questions like, can I really make it through this? Is, is this a journey that I can actually finish and, and finish well? Or is this going to take such a toll on me that I'm not sure I'm going to be able to finish this journey well? And I think Mary and Joseph asked similar questions. And so we're going to try to learn from their experience today and see what the Christmas story has to say for those of us who are in a journey right now, or maybe you just got out of one, or maybe you're looking at one in the future, a journey you really don't want to take. What is the Christmas story say to us. So we're going to read Luke chapter 2. This is actually part of the scripture that, that Robin just read. It's going to be on the screen. If you have a Bible, it's Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. In those days, Caesar Augustus, the Roman emperor, issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This is the Roman Empire around the Mediterranean Sea, Europe and North Africa today. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. So will you pray with me to prepare our hearts? God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together on uh, this Christmas Sunday and experience the friendship of, uh, of a new church community. God, we thank you for what this season means, a time of, of preparation for the arrival of Jesus into our hearts and lives all over again. God, we say, search us. Help me to prepare myself, prepare my mind, my heart, and ask, what does it mean for for me to welcome Jesus into, into my life all over again, especially as the new year starts. And uh, what does that look like practically? And for those of us, God, who maybe even right now are taking a journey that we don't really want to take, God, we pray that you would speak to us today and meet us at our deepest point of need and, and, and teach us lessons for the future as well. And so we open our minds and our hearts to you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. So, as they took this journey, there were a couple of routes that, that Mary and Joseph could have taken. 
And in this series, we're kind of uh, retracing their steps through a virtual tour of the Holy Land. So I have a map to show you. Uh, one of the routes was a, a long route that you don't see that would have gone to the right, um, where you see the, the, the blue body of water above Nazareth is the Sea of Galilee. And then there's the Jordan River that runs down all the way to the Dead Sea, which is the body of water at the bottom of the screen. There was a, a route that went along the Jordan, basically. They, they could have taken that route, we're not sure. Um, but the shorter route was through this uh, area called Samaria, and Sychar is a town in Samaria. It's called the Route of the Patriarchs, or the Mountain Road, or the Ridge Road, it's called. It was the shorter route, so my guess is Mary being pregnant, this was her vote. If Joseph was a wise man, he would have gone and helped his wife, you know, take, and taken the shorter route to Bethlehem. And so uh, this is probably the route they would have taken. And I have a silent uh, video um, that I'm going to talk over, and th their journey would have began in Nazareth. So this is the Mount of Precipice in Nazareth. And Luke, Ford, uh, Luke tells us that Jesus was almost thrown off of a cliff by a mob of people after he gave a sermon in a synagogue. This is that area. And the uh, still that you just saw there was Mount Tabor, where it's believed the transfiguration took place. This valley below is called the Valley of Jezreel. It's also called the Valley of Megiddo. And this valley was the site of many, many, many wars throughout Israel's history. As we pan uh, to the right, you won't be able to see it, but down that road, there's a, a tell. It's called Tel Megiddo. Tel is like a, a, an archaeological hill. There's this... Uh, old town uh, built over a fort called Megiddo. And uh, it's, actually, it's a hill, so it's Har Megiddo. If you were here a couple of months ago for the series in Revelation, we said Har Megiddo in English is Armageddon. And so that area that you saw there, the Valley of Jezreel, was the site. It's, it's Armageddon. That's where it is. All of the talk that you hear about the end of the, the age in Armageddon and all this, that place is called Armageddon. And the, the Har Megiddo there, that hill of, of Megiddo, has 77 layers of civilization built on top of one another. That's how many times it's been conquered and rebuilt. We have records from ancient Egypt in, in uh, 1,479 BC, where the Pharaoh says, we're going to march up to Megiddo and, and take over these Canaanites. So this is just north of Egypt. And so Battle after battle after battle after, you know, we read about peace earlier. Conflict after conflict after conflict has taken place in that valley. Jesus could see that valley every day of his life as he grew up in Nazareth. Isn't that interesting? That Jesus could have looked at this valley that represented war, and we think of it in, in our pop Christian culture as the, the place of Armageddon, the final war in Revelation. Perhaps Jesus looked at this valley and he was reminded of the importance of peace and how, how costly peace can be. But that's where Joseph and Mary's journey started there in Nazareth. And as they traveled south, if this is the route they took, and I think it probably was, they experienced many things along their journey. And I thought it would be good to show you, maybe you would appreciate seeing the author of the small group curriculum that this is based on, Adam Hamilton. I have a four minute video featuring Adam Hamilton, uh, you know, taking a video journey down this route of the patriarchs that Joseph and Mary may have taken. So let's check out this four minute video. At this point, Mary and Joseph have been walking for perhaps three days. They've walked through the Jezreel Valley. They've walked over sloping mountains or sloping hills, nothing really difficult in the terrain so far. But they'd also walked past hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of olive trees. Uh, today, there are five million olive trees planted in the West Bank territories, and we're in the middle of Bank in Samaria right now. And, uh, and these olive trees bore silent witness to the child that Mary was to give birth to. It was the extra virgin oil from the olive tree that was prepared and used in the anointing of the high priest, but also in the anointing of the king. And Jesus, of course, is the Messiah. The word Messiah or Christ means anointed one. Jesus was the one who would be the, the appointed one belonging to God who would lead his people who would rule on the throne of David forever. And so all of these olive trees, as they walked past, were all bearing silent witness to the identity of the child that she was about to give birth to. Let's continue on the journey. 
So on their journey, as the caravan of travelers with Mary and Joseph were making their way to Bethlehem, they would have stopped under shade trees like this. They would have looked for carob trees. They were large enough to provide shade for the travelers, and they would have here rested for a time, uh, taken water for themselves. And then, uh, and then they had the good fortune of finding, uh, hopefully, they would find a carob that they could actually eat. Uh, this was the sweet of the poor. And so, so we've uh, found some carob here. It would have been taken in. Hmm. And so they would have stopped for a rest, for water, for a chance to eat the uh, sweets of the carob tree on their journey to Bethlehem. We're arriving at the village of Sychar, where Jesus once stopped to speak to a woman at a well. This is the heart of the ancient Sumerian countryside, and today Sychar House is a Palestinian refugee camp and a good-sized city. The town was located here because there was a water source known as Jacob's Well. The Orthodox have constructed a church over the site of Jacob's Well. The priest here is the one who oversaw the construction of the building. He's a short man, but he's a man of great courage and boldness and, and perseverance. This is the place where Jesus water and spoke to the Samaritan woman who'd been married and divorced five times and was now living with a man, who he called to be the first missionary to the Samaritans. Now, that is, if Mary and Joseph took the road of the patriarchs to Bethlehem. Now, if that is the route they took, it's likely that they spent the night here because there was a water source. Now, inside the church, it's beautiful, and to the left of the altar is the stairway down to what must have been grayed in ancient times. It takes you down to Jacob's well. So now we're, we arrive at Jacob's well, and this would have been the place on day six that Mary and Joseph would have stopped in their journey. It was a, it was a common place. Everyone in biblical times in the time of Jesus knew of Jacob's well. It was here that Jesus stops. He sends his disciples on into town to get them something to eat, to get them supplies, and he waits here for a woman who comes to the well. She comes midday to be able to fetch water, an unusual time for a woman to come to the well. And she fetches water, and Jesus says to her, you remember, she, he says, give me something to drink. And he, she retrieves the water from him, uh, for him. And then she, uh, he says to her, woman, if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask of me, and I would give you living water, spring water, and you would never thirst again. This water came from a well, but, uh, but he would offer living water by which she'd never thirst again. So let's, let's draw some water from Jacob. Excellent water. And here we remember the Holy Family stopping to be able to spend the night at Jacob's well and to retrieve water to drink as Mary was on her way to Bethlehem. Is it cool to see the sites where some of these Bible stories took place? Just to help you picture. By the way, um, in the ancient world, gold, which has always been a universal currency, gold was measured against carob beans, and that pod that he showed, there are beans inside of there, and they're thought to be uniform in size. And so uh, you, if you had a, a, an amount of gold, you would put it in one side of the scale, and then you would put carob beans in the other side to measure it. And if you had 24 carobs, then that would tell you how much gold you have. Our translation of carob comes over to be carrot. Isn't that interesting? And so it was, the, it was chocolate, basically. It's a substitute for chocolate now. Somebody told me earlier, people who are vegan will sometimes use carobs instead of chocolate. So uh, Adam you know, pointed out that they would have stopped probably at Jacob's well. And then uh, the journey, like he said up at that point, wasn't that difficult. But the, after they would have left Jacob's well and gone south, the journey became a lot more difficult. The last couple days of their journey would have been through what's referred to as the Judean wilderness or the Judean desert. And here this beautiful place is, the picture. After traveling for eight or nine days as a pregnant woman, close to giving birth, this is what Mary and Joseph would have encountered on their journey. It doesn't look like a great place to spend a vacation. This, after traveling in, in that condition, this is what they would have come to. Now in the Bible, there are several mentions of the wilderness throughout the Bible. 
Uh, it's in the Gospels, it's one of the places, that, or actually the place where Matthew says Jesus was tempted. And in the Bible, wilderness means desert. And a lot of places in the world picture wilderness as trees and a forest. But from where we live, we're in a unique place to understand what the wilderness actually means in the Bible. It means a desert. It's just a place that is desolate. Mark Twain visited the Judean desert when, uh, when he was alive, you know, 100 more years ago, and said the sheep and goats eat rocks. There's just, there's just it's, there's no vegetation. It's just a, a very difficult, inhospitable place where it's nearly impossible to sustain life. You just have to get through it quickly. Just put your head down and bear down and get through it quickly. And this is what Joseph and Mary would have faced at the end of their journey. Imagine what Mary was thinking. After several days of, of journeying and, and carrying a child, when she reached this place a little over, or almost a year ago, actually, um, my wife's sister and, and uh, her husband came out, and we hiked Camelback, Echo Trail, the Camelback. And if, you, if you've hiked Echo Trail, you know that it's hardest right before the top. You know what I'm talking about? And who here has hiked Echo Canyon? We need to get out more. We need to like <laughs> one church field trip to Echo Canyon. So you climb up the, I think it's the north side of Camelback Mountain. And it's kind of like a walk most of the way up. But right before you get to the peak, you're using your hands. It's not like a climbing wall, it's not like that, but you're, you're using your hands to brace yourself and you're already tired, you're maybe a little thirsty. And so it gets hardest right before the top. Now, it could be that some of you here are in an experience like that right now, where you've already journeyed, you've gone through something difficult, and man, now it's just getting harder. That's what happened to Joseph and Mary. Do you think maybe... Mary asked questions like, why now? <laughs> Do, we don't want to be here. Do, and, and it's already been tough, but now this? Um, God, why would you let this happen? Or do you think she had thoughts like, I don't know if I can make it? Do you think Mary had those kinds of thoughts? I, don't, I think she was human, so I'm sure she did. It's not sinful to have those kinds of thoughts. It's normal. I, I just don't know if I can make it. If I do, I don't know if I'm going to be in any kind of shape to give birth to a child and, and be a new mom after this. This might take such a toll on me. I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to finish this well. And if you're keeping notes, there's a place in your worship handout to keep notes. I think at least once in our lives, we take a journey. We're not sure we can finish well. And some of you might be like, once? What are you talking about? Like, multiple times. When we take a journey, we're just not sure that we can finish it well. Well, the desert wilderness and the journey that you face might involve loneliness, especially this time of year when everybody's supposed to be having a warm, cozy time with their families by the fireplace. And maybe that's not the way it is for you. Maybe that's part of your Judean wilderness. It could be a broken relationship. It could be marriage difficulties. Uh, it could be work conflict, as Robin said earlier. It could be career questions. Maybe, maybe you're not happy in your job and you're, you're looking for guidance and you're thinking through your options. Maybe you're looking around and things are getting you know, just, uh, tempestuous at work and you're just kind of, God, what, God well, now it's getting worse. Am I going to be able to finish this? Well, God, maybe it's a health scare. Maybe you've just been dealing with a health problem and it just seems like, oh, it's just piling on. And maybe it's something that happened to you a long time ago. Maybe it was mistreatment and it just kind of comes to a head. Maybe, again, this time of year, and uh, maybe you're afraid of what you see in America and the cultural polarization of America and what that means for your faith when people who claim the name of Jesus say things that just seem irresponsible, and it blows up in the news, and these kinds of things bother me. I don't know about you, but maybe it's just almost discouraging. Maybe it's something in your faith journey where you're like, man, I just feel like I'm coming to a place of, of the desert wilderness here. I just have so many questions, so many doubts. Whatever it is for you, I wonder if you feel like Mary, I just can't go any farther. I'm not sure that even if I finish this, I think this might take such a toll on me that I'm not sure I'm going to be the same. You know what I'm talking about? Have you asked those questions about journeys that you have experienced? Now, this would not be the last time that Mary would take a journey like this. 
33 years later, she would take a very similar route, actually, with her son as he was headed toward a Roman cross. This was not the first time that Mary, or not the last time that Mary would take a journey that she didn't want to take. And later in the, the video that you saw, Adam Hamilton says, life is filled with journeys and they're not always of our choosing. Sometimes others dictate them. We're laid off from work or we face a serious illness or a child gets pregnant out of wedlock or, or dies tragically or a spouse leaves. No book is more in tune with this reality than the Bible. You could almost describe it as one long set of journeys nobody wanted to take. Interesting. Now there's this passage in the Old Testament book of Isaiah. And I wonder if, if Joseph and Mary would have remembered this passage, it's a, it's a passage about journeys. It's actually a, a promise of God. It comes from Isaiah 43. It says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Your savior. The Christmas story, I think, communicated to Mary and Joseph and, and to us that even when we are not sure that we can finish the journey well, there's the amazing truth in this. Because God is with us and he is our savior, the journey that we fear can actually make us more well than we were before we took it. It's a very counterintuitive thing, but it's so true in, in God's world, in God's economy, in God's kingdom, in God's way of doing things. In, in Luke 2, 11, the angels announced to the shepherd, today in the city of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah of the Lord. Savior in Greek, which is the language of the New Testament, is soter. It refers to uh, salvation, which is sozo. And what that means is, it means rescue or deliverance from something obviously painful, but to a place of peace. But it's not just our definition of peace, such as the absence of conflict. It's peace as in the Hebrew concept of shalom. And it's peace that means something like wholeness, wellness, um, completeness, healing. So savior, salvation, to be saved means to rescue somebody from a difficult, painful, broken situation and bring something out of that that leads to wholeness and peace and healing and completeness. Are we preaching now? Amen, brother. This is what salvation, Savior, means. And so even a journey that we don't think we can even finish it, or at least not finish it without too, way too many scars, the story of Christmas is actually because God is with us in the journey, and this is what God does, that journey can actually make us more well, more whole, more complete, more at peace than we were before we even took the journey. Um, I experienced this pretty much in, in ministry all through the decade of my 20s. If people, like, if, like college-age people, if they tell me they want to be a pastor, Sometimes I want to say, just like, go live in a remote, a remote village somewhere through like the entire decade of your 20s, and then come out at 30 and then start. Because I just got rocked and rolled in the entire decade of my 20s in ministry. I've told you before about the story. Right after college, I went to work at a church in Kansas City as an intern. I actually resigned on 9-11. Some of you weren't here a few months ago when I told that story, but maybe some of you remember that. And it was a very, very painful experience, disappointing. I, I ended up sleeping on a couch for months and months, just, just lost, aimless, looking for you know, the next opportunity and moved back to Ohio where I grew up and um, you know, pulled the couch cushions off my friend's couch to make a bed on the floor. Got a job at a Holiday Inn late one night at third shift. I was mad at God. I mean, I hadn't prayed in months. I saw a stack of Gideon Bibles. And I just started reading, and, and I believe God spoke to me and just helped me release all kinds of anger that I had and bitterness, and it was like a, a whole new start in life. Okay, well, that would be a really nice 
sounding ending to the story, but the story didn't end there. There were still more 20s <laughs> to go through. And so what happened after that story was I worked at the Holiday Inn for a few more months, and this is circa 2002. And I got this opportunity to be a youth pastor in a church. It was about an 11 or 12 hour drive away from where I grew up. I don't want to say where it was because of the stuff I'm about to say about it. And that's just a good thing. When you're talking you know, on the internet, it's a good rule. So I, uh, I went there to be a youth pastor at this church, expecting this to be like, oh man, I feel like God's given me a new lease on my faith. I, just, I feel like I'm ready to go. And I got to this church and started working there. And I discovered very slowly, call me slow, it took me a really long time to discover this, over time, there was a family in the church who were already there who wanted the job that I had gotten hired for, but nobody told me that. Has that ever happened to you? And then they had friends, of course, who started to build an alliance with them. And these are the parents of teenagers in the church. I was the youth pastor, you know, working with the teenagers in the church. These are their parents. And, and so over the course of time, you know, weeks, a couple of months, three months, I realized I don't think these people like me very well. It started to be like gossip, you know, behind my back and opposing decisions that I would make. I couldn't do anything right. They were complaining to the senior pastor kind of behind my back. And have you ever been in a situation like that where it just takes you a really long time and you, you feel like you're in the Truman Show? Like everybody's in on this but me. Like I didn't get the joke, but everybody else did. And so that's what it was like. Only the, the pastor that I worked for apparently didn't like to deal with conflict. And so it just went on and on and on, just like punching back boom, 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 for months and months and months. Some of us have been in journeys for months, maybe years, but a really long time, and you know it just kind of wears you down. And so that was already happening to me. I was, I was feeling anxious and far away from home, no friends around, uh, student loans to hear, no, you know, no real income, already struggling, and, and all this conflict's happening. Then months later, the pastor invited me into his office, and I'm thinking, maybe now we'll start to take care of some of this stuff. And uh, it turns out he had a, a daughter who was about my age, who at time to time would kind of come around, and I, I, I noticed that, and, and, uh, but I just kind of kept my distance. And, and he brought me into his office and sat me down, and he's like, you know, um, my daughter feels like you don't talk to her enough, and I think you should talk to my daughter more. So it's like you're, you're already going throughout life, you know, and it's a journey you don't want to take. And then all of a sudden, like, you know, didn't see that one coming. I walked out of the office thinking, I need to get a new job. And, and it, it was just like this, this breaking moment for me. To some people, it may not sound like that big of a deal. But at that point in my life, you know, early 20s, um, all the anxiety that had built up over time, uh, financial anxiety, um, conflict that wasn't resolved, it really put me in a place where I felt like I was in the wilderness. And I felt alone. I felt trapped. Even, even though it may not sound like that bad of an experience to some people, I understand the way people feel now when they go through really difficult financial struggles or struggles with their career, and they really don't know where to turn. It, it sounds, I mean, you, 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 sound, it, you think you can understand it just from saying the words, but then actually being in that situation, it's just this totally new, oh man, it's just a horrible feeling. And I started to go through that. I already thought it was bad enough, but then it, it got worse on top of that. And that continued for a few weeks. I started looking for a new job and, and didn't find anything. And I thought, you know, I'm I don't have any savings. I can't just resign. It's, it's getting worse. It's getting weirder. And uh, what am I going to do? A friend of mine back in the Midwest contacted me. Just, you know, amazing. And he said that his parents' church was looking for an associate pastor. And I applied for that job. It worked out. It was great. I moved, and it, it turned out to be a pretty cool experience. So my journey had a really happy ending, and it was a few months of difficulty in, in a few weeks of a Judean wilderness experience. But as I've reflected over that since that time, I realized at that time, I was asking questions like, am I, am I going to stay in ministry? I'm starting to see a pattern that really messed up things can happen in churches. No, that never happens. 
should I, should I give up on this? Um, I'm seeing Christians behave in ways that are really unethical. I have no recourse. There's nowhere to file a grievance. This is like a dictatorship. I, there's nothing I can do. Um, I, I was having questions like that in this, in this wilderness experience. But in, in reflecting since then, I realize as difficult and painful as that was, here's what that did for me. First of all, it made me a more empathetic person. Like I said, now, if somebody says to me, you know, I'm really struggling financially, or I'm just not sure to where to turn in my career, you know, I know how that feels. I, I know what that pit in my gut felt like. And I can empathize with that person. I know what it feels like to feel alone, away from home, or maybe even close to home, but the support's not there, and so the person still feels alone. I know what that feels like. I know what it feels like to feel the anxiety of, of uncertainty about the future and, and be looking for guidance and you don't know where it's going to come from and you don't know how things are going to turn out and you're praying and praying and praying and it seems like God's nowhere to be found and there's no answer. I know what that's like. That experience that I wasn't sure I could really get through, that experience actually helped me to feel more peace now when things like that happen again. You know what I mean? It's harder to get to me now because of that experience. I actually have a greater sense of wholeness and stability and peace and empathy and humanity and humaneness because of that experience. An experience that I, I wasn't sure I could really get through well actually made me more well than I was before I experienced it. I think that's what this part Christmas story says to us that you know, Mary and Joseph went through a very difficult journey right before the arrival of Jesus. Right before Jesus showed up, things got really bad. And it, it actually got worse than they thought that it would. That's what their journey was like. And I wonder, what's your journey like? Are you experiencing a journey like that? Have you in the past? Unfortunately, you will in the future. And the questions that Mary, I'm sure, asked, those are the questions we ask. God, why? How am I going to make it? How is this going to turn out? Is God going to answer prayer? Where is God in all this? Where is this going to lead? Am I going to be able to be a healthy, sane person after all this? And the answer, the Christmas story tells us, is you can actually be better than you were before facing this difficult journey. And Jesus shows up, and there's saving and wholeness and wellness that comes out of that. And that makes celebrating Christmas, even if it's through the eyes of faith, a lot more realistic because we know, because, because of God being with us, this is how this story ends. What is, what is your journey? And what is God saying to you about how God can make you better, more well, this journey as you prepare for the arrival of Jesus?